Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, um, again, following up on the theme, not, not much discreet in this talk, but I'll try to put in as much as I can. Um, all right, so uh, the kind of so motivation. We're going to look at a large class of linear programs that have this specific property that the matrices, the constraint matrices A and B, uh, are non negative. And I mean entry wise, non negative, okay? Uh, so this is the kind of LP we, we look at. And if you think about it, um, this is somehow a, a natural class. If you look at uh, like uh, algorithm stats book and look at the first examples that of LPs we show to students, they mostly tend to be of this kind because in, in using this kind of constraints, you can express things like budgets and costs and requirements for packing and covering constraints. So this is a natural class of linear programs. Uh, discrete optimization connection. You can solve uh, bipartite matching uh, within um, this family of, of constraints. And actually, it turns out that some of the algorithms I'll be talking about today achieve the best known running times for approximating uh, a maximum weight uh, matching in a bipartite graph without ever exploiting the matching structure, only looking at the fact that this matrix is non-negative. Okay. So that's interesting. Uh, and there are more applications that maybe I'll mention at the end. Um, sometimes the, the techniques that go behind solving algorithms for this problem are, are broader and they apply in different scenarios, and I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, and I should mention that my Content-wise, my biggest slide is the open problem slide. So there is a lot that I personally still don't understand about uh, these methods. OK, so let's start with some basic transformations. You can think, you can immediately see that we can assume that these right-hand sides are positive, because if the matrices are positive and the variables are positive, there is no way that uh, this left-hand side can be negative. So the right-hand side should be positive. Otherwise, the, problem, the constraint is going to be either trivial to satisfy or trivially infeasible. So A and B are positive or non-negative. And then we, we can scale everything up or down. We can scale the constraints up or down to make uh, our linear program look like this. And I'm going to call this the covering constraints and the packing constraints for obvious reasons. Here you're trying to, each of these constraints is trying to say that an inner product between C and X is at least something and here between p and x is at most something. Okay. So this is kind of my canonical form that I want to think about for these uh, non-negative linear programs. And what are we trying to do? So there are lots of different models and different questions we look at when we try to uh, design solvers for this. We are mostly interested in approximate solvers, so imagine that we are really looking at large scale data. So actually people at like Google and Amazon, I mean, I've talked to quite a bit about uh, implementing some of this stuff. Uh, so we, we are not gonna try in teeter point methods. We are happy with a poly one over epsilon dependence on our approximation parameter. And uh, we are interested in, in various models of computation. So we, there are results for a simple sequential model of computation, parallel models, and even distributed models, which are kind of more important in practice. Uh, and it's kind of very interesting that the, the specific techniques tailored to these non-negative linear programs that are, do not generalize to general linear programs are robust enough that they give us interesting algorithms in all these models. And so first, let me, so there's a kind of a technical detail that's very important. Like, what do I mean when I say epsilon approximation? I mean really a, a plus or plus minus epsilon here in this scale version, which you should really think about as a multiplicative approximation in, in the original formulation, okay? So if you want to think in a scale-free way, you want to make sure that you find a, kind of a, an x. You could scale the axis up or down arbitrarily here. You want to make sure that 
this kind of relation. So this is important because um, lots of the standard machinery will give you additive uh, approximations. And those happen to be the same when applied to this formulation, but they're kind of uncomparable when applied to other formulations. Uh, but I argue that for this context, the multiplicative approximation is something that makes sense. Okay. Again? All right. Okay, so it turns out that uh, this is even lots of the better insights and algorithms we have actually work for even more restricted classes, which are just pure packing and pure covering problems. So these are, as the name suggests, pure packing is when we just have a packing constraints, no covering constraints, but the objective is maximization. You can really think of this as packing constraints plus one covering constraint. One transpose x is at least some gamma. Okay? And this is the same thing. You have like one packing constraint and a lot of covering constraints. So it turns out that uh, solving these guys is actually much easier, at least uh, at the level we understand things, because it's not hard to check that the dual of a, pack, of a pure packing problem is a covering problem and vice versa. Uh, that doesn't apply in general to a, a general non-negative non, non linear program, which is also called a mixed packing and covering, does not have this uh, kind of duality properties. It's not closed and in this duality. Okay. All right, so why, why do I bring this class up? So what's special about this class is that we, have, we can get this multiplicative approximation in a way that's much more efficient than we can for generic linear programs. So there's something special about this non-negative constraint structure that allows us fast algorithms. Okay, so um, a generic linear program you can really think about as a kind of non-smooth uh, convex optimization problem. And uh, for non-smooth convex optimization problem, if you follow kind of classical theory of first order methods, uh, the running time of your algorithm will depend on something which is called the, the Lipschitz parameter of your objective, often denoted by rho. In the case of linear programs, uh, this is often called the, the width of a linear program. Uh, that you can really think about it as the largest entry appearing in any of the constraint matrices. So the largest number uh, inside your constraint. That's, kind of, that's a measure of no smoothness because it says that if you change your input by a little bit, one of the constraints will be affected by something, by, so by a little bit delta, one of these constraints will be affected by an amount which is delta times rho. So if a small change in delta can cause a huge change like delta times rho, the, 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 the larger the rho is, the more no smooth the problem is. Um, okay, so usually, uh, if you follow, again, classical first order methods, there is not much you can do to get rid of this row dependence. So the most trivial thing gets, gives you a row squared over epsilon squared number of gradient computations. And here, when I say gradient computation, you should always think about some simple matrix vector multiplication. There's a nice trick uh, by plotting Schmoyce and Tardosh uh, that achieves a, what's called a width reduction, so they can get row uh, they, they can get the multiplicative approximation just with rho over epsilon squared. And then if you go, if you're willing to use Nestor of accelerated methods, you can get rho over epsilon. But all of this depends on rho. And as you have, no, as, a, as I have mentioned, rho is the largest entry inside the matrix. So these algorithms are not, are not polynomial. Uh, you know, this, this rho is the actual number, not the description, so it could be exponentially large in the description of the problem. Uh, even more worryingly, you know, maybe there is only one entry which is huge and your, your algorithm still has to have this very slow running time because you have this one entry that's very large. So, um, so what's the, there is this, what, what, so this, the reason why non-negative linear programs are interesting is that there are these width independent algorithms. And the kind of, the truly first uh, 
weight-independent algorithm was given by Luby and Nissan in 1993. And they essentially started with some um, continuous time interpretation. They came up with a way of solving these uh, pure packing and cover angle P's in this number of iterations, either O tilde heights log factors, uh, so some polylog over epsilon to the fourth, and the running time, which is n over epsilon to the fourth, where n is the, the sparsity of your constraint matrix, so the, the non-zero, the number of non-zeros in the constraint matrix. So this is great because there is no row here. So it doesn't matter how big, how small you know, this, these constraints are. Uh, there is something that allows us uh, to really just um, depend on the number of non-zero matrices. Uh, Lorenzo, are these algorithms for general non-negative LPs or just for these are for, for? These are, uh, Ruby and Nissan is only for pure. Uh, there are algorithms that achieve this kind of running time for mix and packaging. They were discovered after Ruby and Nissan. The original Ruby and Nissan, I believe it's only for pure. So there is a lot of work on this. Is a, uh, but I know that mixed, the mixed packing and covering you can do with one over epsilon cube. It's the best known of it. Doesn't the Lubin Nissan algorithm need the, the, the matrix explicitly, whereas the other right. algorithm that is correct. just needs an oracle? Yes, I, good, very good point. I omitted that slide at some point in my revision. Right, so very good point. So in all of this talk, I'm, I'm assuming that our problem is given to me explicitly. Okay, so I, I see this whole matrix. Um, the beauty of some of these more general techniques like mirror descent is this, that these also work, this one in particular and this one, they work for um, implicitly defined uh, linear programs or, or even online linear programs in which uh, I don't see all the constraints but I can find one uh, a constraint that's violated, or I have an oracle that gives me a new constraint at every iteration, you still get this kind of running times. Uh, in order to get a row over epsilon, you need this explicit property. But um, for the purpose of this talk, I want to keep it very simple. So just staying in this framework in which we see the whole constraint matrix, uh, there are very interesting cases, which I'll mention in the open problems, where we, we want to do uh, implicitly given in your problem. But that is true. So in some sense, uh, these methods are more powerful because they extend to more online settings. But you know, even if we really go look at the best first order methods we know, uh, this kind of you know, I think this row dependence is inescapable. I think there are a few papers that manage to turn this row into an n, but the, so you would get quadratic running time. And I think this is algorithm by Luby and Nissan was really the first algorithm they gave a width independent near the linear time, which is what people in practice really want. You, I mean, so the, the, if you ask somebody who actually works with this, the first requirement is it has to be near the linear time because n is huge. Uh, width independent because the numbers inside these problems uh, vary a lot. And the other thing is, it turns out that this epsilon to the fourth is actually pretty poor. So this algorithm uh, did not really get too much traction in practice, at least as far as I understand. People have been, this epsilon to the four is, is so poor, and it actually, it actually appears in, in the empirical uh, evaluations that people would rather use uh, interior point methods. So we'll see that in recent work, um, a bunch of people, including myself, have improved largely the state of this dependence on epsilon. I kind of, that's what this talk about is about. Uh, okay, so, when Ben gave his introduction, I kind of freaked out because I had no plot. So in the last minute, I added a few plots. <laughs> so these are not the most polished. Uh, uh, so I just copied some paper. But I think they, they give you an idea. Um, so this is for uh, the parallel kind of algorithms. Uh, so Luby and Nissan gave a log n, log squared n over epsilon, epsilon to the fourth iteration. And a few years ago, uh, ago with uh, Z1, Allen, Joe, we improved this to epsilon cube. And I want to show you something that's going to be useful later. Understanding how this running time, the number of iteration changes as you vary epsilon. So something that we'll see is that these algorithms work by taking the original non-smooth problem and smoothing it. So there are different uh, choices of epsilon 
which are also correspond to different choices of parameters in the algorithms, they lead to different smoothings of the original LP. And so you see that each choice of epsilon here kind of uh, becomes flat, the objective LP value becomes flat at a certain point. That's really the phenomenon that, that the iterative solver has really solved optimally, essentially, that, that, that smoothing of the problem. So it's not, this is the, the, the actual value of, oh sorry, I didn't do that. This is the actual value of optimum. And these are different uh, values achieved by different choices of epsilon. They all become flat be before they hit this because all these iterative solvers are not actually solving the original LP, but they are solving a, smoothing, a smooth version of it, which has a slightly lower objective value. This is a typical phenomenon that you will see for these solvers. This is a more useful graph. It's a comparison with other methods for similar choices of smoothings. And so our algorithm, um, this, is also, this is our old algorithm, uh, was uh, it's kind of superior uh, to all of them. And actually, um, this is a kind of a mild example. Uh, this is a very small uh, instance. It's like 800. Uh, non N is like 800. And if you take this to much larger instances, this is even more dramatic. OK. So this is kind of my token plot. Um, and now I want to kind of this be a bit more abstract. And I want to talk about so why is even a width independence possible? Like, what's, what's enabling um, this, uh, uh, the existence of these faster algorithms? So first, I think uh, I'm going to start by going on the board and talking for a second just as a, as a review of like how would you go about solving a generic LP, and then we will uh, we will uh, see how within the same framework we can make some improvements and solve one of these non-negative linear programs instead in a faster time. How much, how long is this talk? <laughs> <laughs> I could go, I could go, but. Let's go, it's 11 30. 11.30, okay, thank you. These are little details I forget to check sometimes before I, uh, okay. So, uh, let's look at approximately solving a linear program using first order methods. Okay, so suppose we are just trying to solve AX less or equal to B. Uh, so the really, you know, we are trying to come up with a, an, a, an approximate solver. So you, in some sense, you can think about it as trying to minimize some epsilon, where ax minus b is less than epsilon times 1. So you think about, about it as uh, you, you want to minimize the maximum violation. So here, uh, I should say, I'm working on with the feasibility problem. So you, ca you can reduce, for LP, in general, you can reduce uh, uh, optimization, uh, optim optimizing a program to checking whether a program is feasible using binary search. So let's just worry about this also because the notation will be already complex enough without having another objective function floating around. So that's what you're trying to do, and it's not hard to come up with a saddle point formulation of this. Looks like this. You want to minimize over all x exactly the quantity. And another way of writing uh, this maximum violation is really by taking y over the simplex and thinking about uh, y transpose ax minus b. So this, is, this just picks out the maximum element of ax minus b, which happens to be the maximum violation. Um, okay. So now we really think about this function here is the function we are trying to optimize. So it is a nice convex, non-smooth function. It's not smooth because it's a, it's a max of a linear function. 
So it's not necessarily smooth. OK, so the, the main trick, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but is this idea of smoothing or regularization. The idea is that this problem is non-smooth. Let's change it a tiny bit. And in the process, let's make it smooth. And the way that's done in this setting, when you're working over the simplex, is simply by adding an entropy term. So, any questions on this? So now you're trying really to maximize, not only minimize not only the maximum element, but some trade-off of maximum element and entropy over y. And this eta is a, is a, is a positive, is a non-negative parameter. The result is that you get this nicer function to optimize now. You want to minimize. So this here is the convex conjugate of something. So this function can actually be written as eta Call this the softmax with parameter eta of the vector ax minus v. So, so many of you have probably seen this function. This uh, uh, it's a smooth version of the maximum of the entries in this vector. It's a, it's a good approximation to to the original because you can actually show that uh, the max of Ax minus b is less than the soft max of Ax minus b, which is less than the max plus eta log n. This log n comes from the maximum value of the entropy. So it's a nice function where eta is small. It's very near to max. But it has this benefit that it is smooth. So softmax is uh, 1 over eta smooth with respect to uh, the L infinity norm. So this is a standard thing uh, in uh, kind of uh, Moro Yoshida regularization, this function is strongly convex with respect to L1, and so this is smooth with respect to L infinity. So uh, this is a kind of how you would set up from the point of view of smoothing uh, this, uh, um, the, the, the solution of a, a general linear program. Um, once you have a smooth function, you can apply kind of your uh, your favorite, uh, your favorite uh, uh, first order method for solving for smooth optimization. Okay, so now we have the smooth function, which I wrote there, f eta of x. So you solve using you know, uh, a smooth optimization solver. So this could be, as here, it could be gradient descent, mirror descent, accelerated gradient descent. And you will get, uh, so for, for, for gradient descent and mirror descent, you'll get results that look like the smoothness times log n times some notion of diameter over epsilon squared. And for AGD, you get uh, the square root of the over epsilon. So notice that I, I just wrote smoothness here um, like L. There is a catch, which is you know when I go through this reduction, the, the smoothness of, of soft max is, is 1 over eta. 
but my variables are not ax minus b, my variables are x. Right? So the actual smoothness of f of theta of x as a function of x is 1 over eta. And then you need to multiply. Uh, you know, you're looking really at the Hessian, so you really need to, to multiply by the norm of a squared. And usually the way that this is done is people look at the um, 1 to infinity norm. This is, again, the largest entry of a. This is going to be your value of l. And so if you want your error to be epsilon, you would set eta to be epsilon over log n. <coughs> so you would get log n over epsilon. And um, actually, so I, I cheated a bit, but essentially, uh, this is the kind of smoothness you get. And if you do things right here, you'll just get the norm of a squared and the norm of a. So yeah, just the idea that I want to show you is that we have this nice soft max regularization. But because our variables are x and not ax, we pay this extra cost of the, of the, the square of this norm of a of the largest entry of a. And that shows up in all our bounds. Um, so then the idea is, you know, what you really want to be able to do is, in some sense, is do is apply one of these algorithms in the AX space, really. But you're losing the epsilon as well, right? Epsilon cubed and epsilon over three uh, This is just for generic uh, linear programs. So this should be a, a yeah, I made a mistake the way I wrote it before. So. This is correct. I, I didn't mean to write L. So th this is the correct version. Um, right. So the, the idea, you know, the kind of way I want to present with independence to you is that we're going to be able to run one of these algorithms while really living in this AX space instead of living in this X space. And then our smoothness is really going to be uh, log n over epsilon instead of this. Any questions about about this? Okay. Right. Uh, so in some sense, if you actually look inside these algorithms, there are multiple places in which you can strengthen uh, this, this argument. Uh, there is a, a strengthening or the smoothing that we're going to need, which is pretty simple but cute. And then the, the main interesting thing for me is that there is a strengthening of the way you can do gradient descent which makes it look more like you're working in this AX space rather than in this X space. Should be done in one hour. Uh, no, we know you want to late. <laughs> no, it is a, well, I can go on the board. <laughs> uh, OK, let, let me. Uh, so I have 15 minutes. Um, let me quickly tell you, uh, tell you about these two strengthenings. This one is actually dual to this one, so it's less interesting. Um, so first, a different smoothing. And this is a kind of not strictly necessary, but it makes things much easier to work with, and it has algorithmic consequences. So I wanted to show it to you. So, so I'm going to start with you know, this formulation here. But now I'm, I'm going to do something slightly different, which is, and now all that I'm writing now is like, say, for packing LPs. Okay. So rather than doing that, so I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to think about uh, minimizing minus 1 transpose x, such that px is less than 1, because I like convex functions. So. When I think about minimizing uh, x, 
and then I'm going to have maximum over y. Okay, so this is kind of an equivalent formula, is my saddle point formulation. Same idea as there, but now rather than bounding on the simplex, I'm making this kind of a penalty function. This is like an indicator. When px is larger than 1, this guy blows to infinity. Still the same program. And now, rather than using the usual entropy, I use the regularizer, which is the generalized entropy. So it's kind of, it's the entropy, but extended to the whole positive orthant. Hmm? Sorry, I'm blue. Thank you. Ah, is it? So, um, this usually does not work for, for, for generic LPs, but it gives nice bounds for uh, packing and coloring. So the using the non-negativity, we get both a regularization error. Let, let me first write the, the smooth function. So the smoothing that we get, it's a, a function that you'll see a lot. If you, if, you, if you look at any of these packing and covering papers, you'll always see this function popping up. Uh, this is the, the closed form of this max. And this is, you can really think about as a penalty term. It's a kind of a harsher penalty that in that case, because this, there is no log in front, it's just an exponential. And is, we have some nice bounds. There is a regularization error. Uh, so here we, we used to get an additive error. And it turns out that in general, this regularizer is not good for generic LPs because you, you can get a very big error. But for non negative LPs, you get nice bounds. You get that. Um, 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 Okay, so let me write it in, in terms of opt. You get the, the, the opt of the LP is within, log n, is within a multiplicative factor of the, the, the mean of this F mu. And I should say minus opt because well, opt, the opt of that LP is within a, a multiplicative factor. Of, um, of this. I, yeah, I never got this news right. Thank you. All right. Okay, so this is one, th this depends on the non negativity. So the fact that you can use this smoothing, this different smoothing, depends on having a packing and covering LPs. And let me tell you why this move thing is nice. So, so in this case, during your program, you would have to take gradients of this. And the gradient of this function, uh, so let's call it g of g of x, is this exponential weights that you might have seen. So the gradient at i looks like a j i e to the a x uh, minus b gradient at yes j probably have seen so this is what the gradient of the soft max looks like if you want to do a distributed algorithm you start having trouble because each of your variables needs to know about the normalized sum of all these weights. So this smoothing is not very good for distributed algorithms. And uh, while if you use this smoothing, uh, the gradient of f mu 
is there is no normalization now because there is no log, and it's just uh, aj <coughs> i e to the one over mu ax minus b minus one. So this is very important if you want to get distributed algorithms. It makes life much simpler. And then I should also mention that there are other regularizers that only work in this non-negative linear program setting that are even nicer. And you can ask Elena about it uh, if, if you're interested. Okay, so that's it, the idea for the smoothing. There's a different kind of smoothing you can do for non-negative LPs. Now let me give you a quick idea of why you can do something different for gradient descent, which I think is kind of a very, uh, well, it's a crucial point in understanding why weak independence is possible. I'll try to be fast because I also want to tell you about the open problems. Okay, so I want you to keep in mind this uh, f mu function. And actually, you can take mu to be uh, epsilon over log n. Um, so what, what do you do when you do gradient descent? You're kind of, you're looking at the Taylor approximation of the function around your point. Because the function is smooth, you have some upper bound to it. And then you kind of try to move, you move to the point which minimizes your upper bound. That is gradient descent for smooth functions. Uh, so let's do the same here, but let's be a bit more careful. Let's tune it to this function f mu. <coughs> so what does a Taylor expansion of x mu give? Suppose I am at some point x, and I add some delta. So this could be a vector. So this is going to be the gradient of f mu, which I've already written there. Okay, and then what I care about is this Hessian term, the second order term. Usually, when you use smoothness, you would just write you know, something uh, depending on a norm. But instead, we're going to be more careful. We're going to actually estimate the actual Hessian of our problem. And there's a simple argument here that says that as long as eta uh, times a times delta is less than 1 over epsilon, uh, so as long as you live within this ball, this is kind of the ball in which the Hessian doesn't change too much, this is like this is like uh, 1 over mu. I remember that this gradient here, by what I wrote before, was a transpose yx minus 1, where these are these exponential weights. I forgot to mention it here. This gradient here has these exponential weights. I call this each of these weights yx of i, it really tells me, uh, you know, it's a measure of how violated is the i constraint is. So this is the gradient. And the Hessian looks like this, the diagonal of y, a. OK, so now I can at least give you some intuition of why you would expect to be able to do something better than gradient descent. OK, so. When is Delta. hmm? Delta's. Delta's everywhere. Thank you. I hire Yelena to do this. Like she follows me around and through the, no, really. <laughs> uh, it's uh, um, okay. So what's happening is so when is gradient descent bad? Gradient descent is bad uh, when your function is, is is not very smooth. Okay. So in some sense, this blue curve. Yeah, is, it has a large curvature, and you cannot make big steps. So you think of that as 
uh, that, you know, uh, bad smoothness in some sense means that this quantity is large. This particular direction delta you're moving in, this quantity is large, so you cannot really, so you're forced to make a small step, okay? But what happens because of non-negativity non of A is that uh, whenever this quantity is large, you can actually show that A transpose Yx must also be large. And that happens because all these numbers here are non-negative. So there are no cancellations inside this product. That means that the only way in which this can be large is really if it's A transpose Y is large. But A transpose Y is related to the gradient. So this is saying that the function is non-smooth, so it, it curves very quickly only when the gradient is steep. And that means that even in those cases, you can make a certain improvement that in general is not possible. So in general, your no smoothness may be present even when the function is kind of very flat. So, so this basic idea plus a lot of kind of uh, work around it because you know, this is good, but it doesn't give you much unless you combine it. Uh, you know, you really have to use it in a smart way. Gives all these weed independent algorithms. Uh, so, <coughs> so in the last minute, uh, I hope I gave you some intuition. Uh, so part of the, the, the goal of our papers was really to get to this kind of more optimization friendly view of width independence. Uh, because the original papers are really written from a more purely algorithmic standpoint without the consideration of relation to other optimization classes. Uh, there are some cool extensions, in particular to SDPs. So surprisingly, we have a lot of work on uh, integrals of exponentials. You can kind of get the same result for packing SDPs and for and also for some implicit SDPs. Uh, and then, okay, open problems is something, so there are lots of open problems in this area and lots of things I really don't understand yet. So uh, in order of increasing vagueness, very concrete problems, we still have some mismatch in, uh, and some open questions about running times. So the biggest open question to me is, can you get uh, a parallel solver the trans in one over epsilon. This is a, answer a practical, very important question. Um, right now, the best is one over epsilon squared. And if we could get one over epsilon with a parallel or distributed solver, this would have practical implications. Our results for mixed covering, mixed packing and covering are worse than the ones for pure packing and covering, so fix that. Understand better this theory of different smooth things for these non-negative linear programs. So at some point we've been thinking about construct, you know, can, are there lower bounds, relevant lower bounds for these non-negative linear programs, some reductions from generic LPs. Um, Safi mentioned, so in using these same ideas for implicit packing and covering, and I think Chandra Chakuri had some results on this. In my first talk in the boot camp, I talked about the continuous time analog of first order methods and the discretization viewpoint, the kind of was useful in understanding how you could vary, how you could modify the algorithm. I don't have any discretization understanding of these guys. Um, right. And then the cool thing is um, what happens in all these algorithms is that your delta, uh, because you want to respect this, you want to pick a delta that has to respect this condition, the game you tend to play is that you keep your x feasible and you really think of your delta as some kind of uh, diagonal scaling of x. So, you, you know, in some sense, what you know at time t is that this direction, the xc direction, uh, is, is good if your x is feasible. So, lots of these algorithms are based on multiplicative updates. So, you take your x, each x, and you multiply by a small constant. And there is a kind of, there is a way of thinking about this as in some sense, the right variables shouldn't be x, but should be e to the y. These x should be exponentials. And there's an open question of whether there is a way of reformulating all of these 
using this exponential change of variable, and then interior points. If, now can you use these ideas for interior, better interior point methods for this case? All right. That's it. The fact that uh, you're using these multiplicative updates, uh, well, first in the fact that you can tolerate the, the mu to be um, uh, epsilon over log n, which is what you would get if you if you were working the range of a, and then the fact that your your, your updates are you know uh, multiplicative in x because you're really trying to maintain this property with, res with respect of how much you are moving in the, in the range of A. So really trying to have moves, make moves that <coughs> don't change your slacks or your violations too much. So in the sense, they, they give you a, a bounded movement in the range of A while uh, walking, while moving in the right directions. And so now this appears to be easier for these negative LPs. And, and um, so the diameter appears, or some version of initial distance, should it mm -hmm. appear somewhere? How, how does that appear? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the, the, like the range of A, like things get amplified. Right. So the, the diameter here, uh, um, there, uh, there is a trick in some sense where the diameter you can somehow relate the diameter to opt. So it kind of gets built into this multiplicative approximation. Let's thank Lorenzo again.